Hey everybody, welcome to the Stoner Report. Hey Derek, can you grab the lights for me please? So sorry, we were preempted uh, last week uh, unexpectedly. Um, and <laughs> that's okay. It's no worries. And uh, so this week I'm back. So a couple of the stories from this week are going to be uh, from, from last week as well. And I'll start off like I usually do and read off the headlines. Um, Switzerland decriminalizes marijuana possession. Romania legalizes medical marijuana, becomes the 10th EU co country to permit therapeutic use. The U.S. Supreme Court rejects marijuana reclassification appeal. Why didn't the shutdown cut funding for the DEA? It's one of the least essential government agencies. Grand Rapids, medical marijuana ban at Michigan Supreme Court. Medical marijuana farmers, market opens in Seattle. Uh, Latin America builds momentum against U.S.-backed drug war. A historic hemp harvest wraps up with the help of 45 volunteers from six states. And then um, I'm going to show a video this week. It's going to be uh, the, a Riverside cop tricks an autistic teen into buying pot. All right, hang on one second. I'm just going to make sure that uh, I got all the mics checked and everything. And hello to everybody in chat and thanks for watching. Everything seems to be going. Great. I forgot to run the intro th today. I'll run it at the end. <laughs> and um, next week I'm not going to be on. It's my birthday next week. I'm taking a week off. And after that I will have a 3D rendered intro. So that'll be pretty cool. Uh, so let's start off with Switzerland last week. Uh, as of this week, <coughs> the possession of up to 10 grams of marijuana is no longer a criminal offense in Switzerland. In s instead, the Swiss have decriminalized the possession of small amounts of weed, replacing possible jail time and a criminal record with a maximum fine of $110. The new law went into effect Tuesday. The change in the Swiss drug law brings the country in line with other European countries that have either formally or effectively decriminalized pot possession. It also brings uniformity within Switzerland, where previously some cantons had turned a blind eye to marijuana offenses, while others came down hard on offenders. The change will also relieve pressure from Swiss police and courts. The country has dealt with 30,000 or so marijuana charges each year, a number that should decline dramatically under the new law. Okay, this is a step in the right, right direction. It's still um, decriminalization. It is, uh, it is a uh, ticketable offense. Uh, so with a fine, with a fine, it, it's actually what the uh, police chiefs in uh, uh, Canada are doing, or want want to uh, want to push in the Canadian government. Uh, whereas we're we uh, the the problem with that is um, that uh, sorry, I'm losing focus here. The problem with that is is that uh, the police can still bully people and uh, selectively enforce the laws, like stop and frisk and other laws like that even though uh, even though uh, it's uh, decriminalized okay. chat, Ooh, I haven't been able to check the chat oh, have you okay cool mm. sorry about that I'm trying to uh, do a bunch of things at once and I'm getting a little distracted here but it's alright Romania become legalized medical marijuana. I think I becomes the tenth EU country permit therapeutic use. Okay, 
Authorized medical pa patients in Romania may now use marijuana to ally their pain under new provisions in the two countries' narcotic laws. Romania legalized medical marijuana this week, becoming the 10th member of the European Union to do so, according to local reports. Currently, possession of marijuana is outlawed throughout the country. The recreational medical marijuana use is still prohibited. Derivatives of the plant can now be used to treat certain medical conditions such as epilepsy, cancer, and sclerosis. Manufacturers will also be able to apply the National Agency for Medicines for approval to market drugs that contain marijuana byproducts like res resins or plant fr fragments. So that's uh, another step in the right direction for Europe. You're all good, by the way, over here, Mr. Mario. Oh, thank you. Excellent. Uh, let's see. Oh, I should have gone back to the camera before I do, do stuff like that. Like I said, I'm doing this for the first time. There's a lot of activity in the room. It's a little distracting, but I'll get over it. Uh, yeah, some bad news from the States. The Supreme Court rejected the marijuana classification appeal. The U.S. Supreme Court Monday declined to hear an appeal from medical marijuana advocacy groups who had challenged the DEA's decision to maintain marijuana status as a Schedule I drug under the Controlled Substances Act, the category reserved for the most dangerous substances. The court denied a summary order, a petition for a writ of certiorari from the groups led by Americans for Safe Access which had sought Supreme Court's review of a D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals decision upholding the DEA's ruling that a change of marijuana's classification required the Food and Drugs Administration recognition of acceptable medical uses for the drugs. Advocates for scheduling marijuana have been trying to do so for more than four decades, but have been thwarted by the DEA and, in, in, and intransigence. This was the third formal rescheduling effort to be blocked by the EEA decision-making. Schedule I drugs are deemed to have no acceptable medical uses and a high potential for abuse. Other Schedule I drugs include LSD, MDMA, and heroin. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> despite the fact that there is an ever-increasing mountain of research detailing medical marijuana medicinal effects, and despite the fact that 20 states in the District of Columbia have legalized me medical marijuana, the EEA continues to insist that it cannot be downscheduled. Well, there's plenty of reasons for that, and we're all aware of the, the, the many-fold reasons why they don't want marijuana legalized. Let's see, how are we doing for time? It's 10 minutes. Yeah, I'm going to play a video halfway through and come back at 4.20, I think. <laughs> so speaking of... Uh, <coughs> Speaking of the DEA, why didn't the shutdown cut funding for the DEA? It's one of the least essential government agencies. The GOP House temper tantrum induced shutdown of the U.S. government can be called many things an extortion, a frustration, an outrage. Name your unflattering descriptor. But if it does anything of use for the American people. It serves up an ir inarguable indication of the government's true priorities. It shows us verbatim which programs are deemed essential and which aren't. For instance, the national parks and almost a million, million federal employees have been cut off while the military continues to operate full force. And while the injustices of the shutdown are many, among the most hypocritical government priorities is the continued funding of the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency. Bill Piper, director of the National Affairs for Drug Policy Alliance, an organization fo focused on ending the war on drugs, sent an email to support us, supporters on Friday asking why the DEA was considered essential during the government shutdown. You and I both know the DEA isn't effective, he wrote, so why is it considered essential? A very good question considering the fact that even if fighting the war on drugs was a reasonable priority to maintain during a shutdown, it isn't, and the DEA has long since lost the war. Since its inception in 1973, it has failed to reduce the number of drug-related crimes in the U.S. and continues to place more than 1.2 million people behind bars each year for mere possession of illegal substances. Well. <sighs> <laughs> 
what can I say? Obviously, the DA should be shut down entirely. And it's a sign of a, a corrupt government that is uh, keeping it afloat while uh, essential services are being cut. Okay. Now, things aren't all uh, happy in uh, Washington State, as some mar medical marijuana activists fear that they fear for their industry. Uh, after clearing an early pathway for marijuana legalization, medical cannabis activists are afraid their businesses could be swept under as Initiative 502 forces them to comply with new regulation designed with a, a recreational market in mind. The, the Seattle City Council voted Monday to require medical and recreational marijuana businesses to apply for a marijuana license under I-502 regulations, which legalize recreational cannabis. The rule would place medical and recreational cannabis programs in the same channel, requiring them to obtain the same license, and Allison Holcomb, said Allison Holcomb, attorney for the state's American Civil Liberties Union and author of I-502. The government is trying to control medical marijuana and load those businesses into the Titanic that is 502 licensing and set it a sale, said Steve Sarich, leader of the Cannabis Action Coalition. That would eliminate mer medical and I-502 in one fell swoop. So there are some concerns that uh, normally people who have been selling medical marijuana now have to pay extra to sell and that would uh, obviously affect people who, who require medical marijuana for their health. Okay, I'm going to uh, attempt to play a video now of uh, a rather sad incident that happened in December about an autistic youth that was over several months uh, coaxed by an uh, undercover DEA agent into uh, selling him marijuana. And it's, the story is so horrific and uh, you'll just have to see it to believe it, I think. We felt like our family was totally violated by the sheriff's department and we felt ultimately betrayed by the school district. If the teachers start sicking undercover operators onto their students, that trust is gone and so is the school. It's not the drugs that are harmful anymore. It's the war on drugs that's so harmful. Temecula is a city in Riverside County, California, with a population of about 100,000 people. It's consistently ranked in the top five safest cities in the U.S., according to Business Insider. Doug and Catherine Snodgrass had no worries about raising their four children in the area, particularly their teenage son, who's an autistic high school student. He also has been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, Tourette syndrome, um, several anxiety disorders, and... Um, every day is a challenge for him, but he's a, a beautiful boy. Their son's list of disabilities have many in the community wondering why he was targeted last December in an undercover drug operation. Their son, who wished to remain unnamed, began attending a new high school in the Temecula Valley Unified School District last fall at the start of his senior year. He rarely made friends, so his parents were thrilled when he told them that he had made a new friend on his first day of school. He told me that he met a new friend in art class, and I was completely amazed by that. It seemed like uh, they were having these great conversations back and forth or what seemed typical for a teenager because there was such a furious amount of texting going on. But those texts weren't just friendly teenage banter. Instead, their son's new friend was pressuring him to buy marijuana. And this new friend wasn't just a teenager. He was an undercover cop who went by the name of Daniel Briggs. He said that he was having a lot of trouble with his family and that he was under a lot of stress and he needed something to make him feel better and he just couldn't cope. So our son said, you know, I was worried about the guy. Daniel gave him $20 and our son said he would 
find a way to get him some pot. It took the Snodgrass's son three weeks to buy half a joint of pot off a homeless man. This process was repeated a second time. When Daniel asked a third time, their son refused. After that, Daniel stopped communicating with him altogether, which our son seems pretty broken up about. And he was back to, back to zero friends, so he was alone again, and it really hurt him. A few weeks later, armed policemen walked into his classroom and arrested him in front of his peers. His parents were not notified of the arrest at the time. He was taken to a juvenile facility for 48 hours. 22 students were arrested in the drug sting. Most of them were special needs students, causing police tactics to come into question. Our current policy for dealing with this stuff is, is a, a, a complete failure. We need to rethink our policy. All we're doing is using the hammer and we're creating new nails like these children here. Stephen Downing spent 20 years on the force with the Los Angeles Police Department, located two counties northwest of Riverside. The LAPD pioneered drug busts in high schools in 1974. The Los Angeles School District General Counsel launched a review into the undercover program in 2004. The review found no evidence that the program reduced the amount of drugs on school grounds. However, there was evidence of an increase in arrests of special education students. The LAPD disbanded the program in 2005 after the review concluded that it had failed to catch serious drug offenders. In this case, there was no crime until the kid had been talked into going out on the street and finding something, and he did it to keep his friendship with somebody. Um, that's a sting. That's a nasty, degrading sting. A Department of Justice report likewise concluded that sting operations in general do nothing to solve long-term crime and that they may prevent the use of other, more effective problem-solving techniques. It can be economically difficult for police units to disband undercover operations in high schools despite questionable results. Every arrest they make it goes on the quota wheel. It's, it's, it's another notch on the quota wheel. It helps them get federal grants. It helps them get equipment. It helps them get SWAT teams built up. It helps them participate in, in task forces that pays overtime. It helps them get uh, asset sharing that brings millions of dollars into their departments that are basically uh, a police-led uh, slush funds. And so there are too many incentives in the drug war for them to say anything other than Gee, we made a big bust at the so-and-so high school and we arrested 23 kids for dealing dope. Big, bad dope dealers. One in 200 youths were arrested on drug-related charges in 2010, according to the Department of Justice. Policy experts say that those who get caught up in the legal system as a juvenile are less likely to become upstanding citizens later in life. I know kids get into trouble and, with drugs, and those kids that most times successfully escape that trouble escape it without the benefit of the criminal justice system or their school. They escape it by concerned parents uh, seeking out the best uh, uh, solutions. The Snodgrasses took their case to court and their son was found not guilty in exchange for 20 hours of community service. He eventually returned to school in March through a court order. The Temecula Valley Unified School District is still fighting to expel him due to their zero tolerance policy when it comes to drugs. The Snodgrasses have sued the school district for unspecified damages. They claim the school officials should have protected their son instead of working with the police to manipulate him. The sting operation caused their son severe anxiety and emotional distress. He just totally lost trust in, in everybody and barricaded himself in his room. He didn't want to go anywhere. He didn't want to see anybody. His anxiety went through the roof. And at this point, he's being treated for post-traumatic stress disorder. We don't ever want to see another child or family have to go through what our son went through. And it's really barbaric to have these type of operations where they bring in cops to act like kids, to ultimately get kids who aren't drug dealers, but they teach them to go find drugs and have them bring them onto campus so that they can get a cell and make an arrest. And how does that get rid of the real drug dealers? It doesn't. It basically, um, this experience uh, taught our son how to sell drugs. And that's not why we sent him to school. Hey, uh, 
and I'm back <laughs> from that. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's all good. So, uh, yeah, that was a very tragic story. I mean, uh, the child had no friends, like zero friends. The only one that befriended him was an undercover cop. It just, it's just the most hideous thing. I, I actually cried when I saw that video. I'm not ashamed to say that. <laughs> All right. Let's see. I don't know if I'll have time for all the stories, so I might skip a couple here. Latin America builds momentum against the U.S. backed drug war. One after another, Latin American leaders rose to the podium at the last UN General Assembly to take a stand against the United States Signature Security oh, I'm sorry, my browser is acting weird policy in the hemisphere, the war on drugs. Right here in the same headquarters 52 years ago, the convention that gave birth to the war on drugs was approved. Today we must acknowledge that the war has not been won, Colombian President John Manuel Santos said. He noted that his country, which received more than 3.5 billion in counter narcotics aids between 2002 and 2011, and is frequently cited as a model by the Obama administration, has suffered more deaths, more bloodshed, and more sacrifices in this war than almost any other. Santos, as he has done before, called for changing course. He stated that he led the effort in the organization of the American states to study different scenarios alternatives to the drug war, and commission studies that will be made available to the public and evaluated in a UN special se session in 2016. Oh yeah, I forgot that I missed uh, 320 or 420 in Alberta. Uh, so I'm going to light this joint. I'm usually a joint person, so I'm lighting this joint. Uh, I didn't bring my bong down today. But uh, you, got, you guys all know what it looks like. So happy, four, happy 420 to everybody uh, on that time zone. I guess it's central. And... Uh, I'll finish off again with another hemp story. Thankfully, uh, people are growing more hemp. And uh, a historic harvest has come in. Here we go, let's get that screen ready. Here we go. Last week, we told you about the beginning of America's first hemp harvest. Well, not me, but uh, in this article in more than 50 years, which started in late September in a southeastern Colorado. This past weekend, that harvest continued with 45 volunteers from six different states who converged on grower Ryan Laughlin's 55-acre hemp plot to finish hand harvesting his historic plants. We had a great group of people, Laughlin says. Now he'll begin the hard work of separating the different parts of the plant and processing them. Laughlin doesn't yet have an exact me measurement of how much hemp he was able to harvest, he planted two varieties in his main plot, a Canadian variety and a European variety. He has three additional varieties and a smaller research plot. The Canadian variety, which is dodicious, meaning the individual plants were either male or female, didn't fare so well, but the monoecious European variety, which plant had both male and female reproductive organs, did much better, Laughlin says. Hand harvesting the hemp allowed for the entire plant to be picked, including the roots. Laughlin has takers for every single part of it. He personally plans to press some of the, hemp, the seed oil into hemp oil. But he emphasizes that it's important to save the bulk of it for next year. The seed is really what we're after, to have an American seed bank, he said. Colorado hemp advocate Eric Hunter was among those who helped Laughlin with the harvest. The first gathering in September was more symbolic, Hunter says. This pa past weekend, however, was like real work, he says. 
I don't mind doing it because it's hemp, Hunter adds. People have so much pent up frustration with the system that it's really an important act of civil disobedience to be op openly participating in such an event. All right. Well, besides that, a uh, Seattle uh, hemp farmer's market opened. Uh, but you can find that story on the front page as I'm going to close the show now. Um, thanks again for joining. Uh, a reminder to everybody in British Columbia that uh, if you haven't signed the petition yet uh, for Sensible BC, please go out and find a canvasser and sign it. Uh, remember, sign only once. If you sign more than once, uh, your signature will be uh, erased, so that's not good. Um, remember, you have to be uh, registered in BC as a voter to uh, sign the petition. So if you haven't, go to uh, electionsbc.ca and become registered as a voter. You probably won't be able to sign the petition, but uh, when this petition succeeds and the issue comes to vote, you will then be able to vote on it. So you'll need to sign up for Elections BC in that event as well. If you are registered to vote and you want to help out, uh, contact sensiblebc.ca uh, and become a canvasser or donate money or do anything you can. Um, I believe tomorrow at 10 a.m. there's going to be a protest uh, at uh, the Vancouver Public Library um, uh, as there's, it's a Monsanto protest and we're going to be uh, uh, taking signatures there. Um, also, uh, there's, there'll be a group of us at 49th and Fraser uh, taking signatures. So, uh, you know, find one in the afternoon. So uh, find one of those groups if you want to come and say hi. So thanks again, everybody, for watching. Um, I don't think I'm going to play the, the entering, the, uh, the intro to the show. I will, uh, however, tack it on to, to the, uh, the recording. So anyways... Um, have a great weekend, everyone. Uh, don't forget, this is the most uh, advanced plant on the planet, and it's going to help us survive. So take care, peace out, and I'll see you next week.